Guys, thank you for tuning in to a special episode of the Traveling Hoopers podcast. We're still in our book club series for Black Ball, um, and we're really excited to read this book. It is by Teresa Runstetter. Hopefully, you've seen her through social media or all of the TV spots that she's been doing over the last couple weeks to get more word out on this book and we're going to be reviewing it and we're in section two which deals with the chapters called i was just on the page i promise you i was uh, trouble <laughs> black favorite black players flood the league in chapter five professional simon gordine in the nba's white ceiling uh guys let's go ahead and just like do a quick breakdown of like chapter four that seemed like a necessary yet messy chapter, especially if you have, it almost reads like a black exploitation film at some points. And I don't mean that in like a bad way. I'm talking about like how things unfold for certain people around drugs and almost kind of being policed for being flashy, even though you can afford to be flashy. There's like a lot of weird things in there. And uh, Philip, you had a interesting point about how the as more black players came into the league it seemed like they were policing especially african-american players a lot harder than they had been in the past do you want me to get into that now because i believe that's the next chapter i thought i could be right wrong though no it's not, you're right this is not this chapter excuse me um so there's two points i want to make on this chapter specifically right but to smooth transition, smooth transition it from what just mentioned, um, there is a, do you mind if I read a little bit of the chapter? So it says, um, shortly after the arrest of Jabbar and Allen in November, 1972, the NBA quietly established its first security office run by ex FBI agent, Jack Joyce. And by June, 1973, Joyce claimed to have a network of security men in each NBA city who reported to him on a weekly basis. This does not happen until NBA, ABA mergers. This does not happen until certain circumstances of where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Allen uh, we're in a force, uh, an unfortunate circumstance, um, dealing with a car and so on and so forth. Um, this does not happen until business decides that they want to police black bodies. That is a very important understanding that one needs to have about the fundamentals of modern sports because this does not just stop now or just stop in 1973. This is the beginning of what sports would turn into all the way into present day 2023. And we had just seen it from um, John Morant currently in the NBA scene um, where nothing is done wrong, right? You have the NRA, for instance, fighting over the rights to bear arms, but you didn't see none of them out with John Morant, right? You don't see all these first, uh, all, all these, you know, rights to bear arm uh, individuals, you know, who are Second Amendment, who are ready to, you know, fight to the death they have to when the individuals who are enforcing and using these lawful, laws themselves are black bodies and that goes from a personal standpoint on an everyday basis but that translates easily to um, professional sports which is a business and business is not ran ethically or morally and that's what makes business business and i think this is a fine indication of that point oh for sure for sure it's and it's like, it's down to the conduct in itself. Like we're seeing policing even from like the media or like 
fans who whose biggest issue does not solely seem like the tickets are high priced and even in the situations where the tickets are really expensive right and Instead of blaming the owners who actually control prices, you'd rather go after the professional athletes that's on the floor. And we already know the what that is stemming from. It's much I mean, easier. Because this also came to mind. You have many generations that you might have heard before, and definitely the generation before us was, you know, the the rhetoric, a common rhetoric at least, was you have to work 100% harder than the person, than the white person, essentially, working 100% next to you, right? However hard they work, you got to work harder. Uh, and this is like an indication of where, like, not that mindset came from, but where that mindset continued to be established, right? Because if something goes wrong, then you are going to be held more liable than peers around you. Um, and that goes for, and, you know, this goes into a whole, uh, this generation, uh, our generation, you will hear this term toss, tossed out called respectability politics mm-hmm. and not trying to reform to the status quo, I guess you would call it. But I have often enough argued that the stat that that's taking context out of the scenario and the status quo is the status quo because it is built and has been built to repress you. So you have to do anything you can to combat that. Now people can go back and forth about like they agree with that or disagree with that. I don't think right now that necessarily matters for this conversation, but I think matters for this conversation is that this is a reality and has been a reality since the founding of this country. But in terms of sports, this book does a really good job at pinpointing and showcasing those different aspects without telling the audience that's what's happening. So it allows the audience to think for themselves also while giving them just accurate information. Um, so what I will say, right, for the given... I guess time frame that these handful of chapters occurred in, right, which at that point, mid to late 70s, right? Um, right, the, the civil rights movement, relative to the beginning of the book, is a little bit further behind, but not that far mm-hmm. behind. Like, the grown people that were there for the civil rights movement were still alive and well. Uh, well, those that didn't get shot, but... Um, or, you know, otherwise died from various other means. But what I think, right, the general thing with uh, what's going on at that point is, well, one, right, it's not like white people magically became super not racist after the I have a dream speech or whatever nonsense. Um, A certain sector of people frequently want to spew. Um, Right, but like now there's a lot of bad stuff they that a lot of them used to do that you can't legally do no more. Um, but like a lot of that sentiment and feeling is still there for them. And something that you will see throughout history is uh, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this correctly, but like white grievance politics is a very salient force in American politics. And that most frequently shows up in the book and in this section when we start to talk about how the fans reacted to so-and-so doing such-and-such or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? And, of course, we still have, you know, uh, stereotypes that that hold a lot of sway, particularly as we're beginning to get into uh, the crack epidemic. for which I blame the CIA, if memory serves, that might be the wrong uh, alphabet organization. But um, and you and like you were seeing a lot of discussion about, you know, black players drug use and the like. Never mind the fact, you know, the white players do it too, but you, you know they don't really care for real. 
Um, but like what, but like there's also an element of, you know, as discussed in the book class where the, where you see black men have in a, you know, hi, effectively a higher class than a lot of the white uh, fans. Right. Right. So of course, right. They see a, you know, one of these well-to-do black men who make money playing a game because you continue to spend money to watch them play this game even as you complain and want to jump into the fights that are happening on the people are stupid um but That's you good. see both like in the context of this of like the NBA in particular but also as they progress into like the 80s and whatnot you see a lot of that white grievance politics that um, it, that like can be mobilized to do a lot of harm even to white people, or as long as you can get them to believe that it harms black people more, right? That and like that resentment that some of the fans feel for again, well-to-do black men making money because you spend money to watch them play a game. Um, and like, just, there's a lot of stuff lost on a lot of people historically. I, I feel like I had a point somewhere, but I'm just going to stop here until we get around to the next thing. All right. So at the, while reading chapter four, I was like physically upset, like recalling some of these people's experiences. Cause I feel like what most, a lot of what happened, cause I know it probably went a little farther than just words back then it just felt like elite level hating it felt like the the most negative parts of like twitter or what we see anywhere else just except it's on one media platform yeah you know elite level hating elite level hating is just called racism (laughs) I i thought that was hate for the platform you like the biggest hater of all if you just racist. Like that just means you got you, you insecure and you upset at other people doing like you this uh, yeah, you're right. This is nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this this was the this was probably the toughest chapter for me so far. So for me, there uh, one other thing stood out to me, and it was when it said in the book it said, uh, although although for many white sports writers Playground play suggested a lack of sophistication or even a kind of black moral falling, uh, failing. And that was talking about uh, Earl Monroe, Earl the Pearl. And I heard that exact same, <laughs> I heard that exact same rhetoric being used towards Patrick Mahomes in football this year, when they said, um, this was said this year. Joe Burr, Patrick Mahomes is the ble- is the best quarterback in the NFL, but Joe Burrow is the best quarterback. What? That doesn't even make sense. This was yeah. on ESPN. Yeah, I saw, like I saw. this was on ESPN, and what they they mean, should resign. But what <laughs> he was he was in contention for a job at NFL this year, like going from analyst to a job. It was nuts, right? That line of thinking is retracting is a modern day way of retracting the sophistication black athletes have in a in a position, right? In, 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 in counterparts to their, or in conjunction to the white counterparts, I should, I, should, I should say. Yeah. And that also showcased how far we have not come because all that was, was coded language, right? That's all it was. And if you don't know understand what coded language is, that's not that crazy to think about. But that but this talking about Earl Monroe, right? This talking about Earl Monroe was talking about the NBA merger in, in uh, the early late 1960s, early 1970s. Right? We all know somebody who was alive during that time. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. In the same thought processes, 
the same speaking points they went from sports writers to ESPN analysts are saying the exact same things in 2022, 2023. Oh, a lot. Like the thing is, right? A lot of the, the people saying those things back then are still alive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we a lot of people, and like there are a lot of people now who, if they were, they might not have been alive for it, but they were raised by the people that were. Facts. I mean, it's true. Like, and that's why I think a, that's why I think a lot of people just forget, right? Or like don't, don't remember. It's like this is not that long ago. These people are alive, and that's why I thought that Jerry Jones picture was really important. Yeah, you had people like you, like you had people like Stephen A. Smith who were trying to like, you know, cover up for it for whatever reason. But like, that's just an indicator. That's just an indication. Like these people are alive. People, kids are alive. People, grandkids are alive. And if the, and unless these people are actively combating this kind of like racist architect then they're just living in it and believing it and perpetuating it and you know that's when you have half of america voting voting for trump (laughs) um you know that's that's when you have that side note i would just like to throw in that i thought it was hilarious that after uh kuma jewel jabbar and his teammate right got back to milwaukee they immediately bailed and didn't do the, the like the, the the little interviews that was scheduled or whatever the press conference and just left and just left their GM just hanging. No, I'm imagining like Kareem trying to slink away at like seven <laughs> in a in, on empty tarmac. It's like, dude, I can see. What, are you just gonna leave? Like, I just imagine that like they got there and they just like hopped out and took off before he could say anything. <laughs> I guess we got to move on to something a tad bit happier, and I know it's it's not really happy, especially it's not. for Calvin's portion, because you we've been talking about this in the group chat. Chapter five, professional was it was a more digestible read, and I think that is a little a little easier of a pill to swallow, considering as a person who is like trying to make their way career-wise, you've already heard, like, the horror stories. So seeing how everything plays out with this, especially with Simon Gordigan, is it's a gut punch, but it is one of those gut punches that you've heard the story so many times that it's kind of be like, oh, okay, that sounds about right. Is it- Which very sick in its own way. Like, yeah, it's professional sick. Yeah. Like, right. it- High-level business sick. Yeah. So, real quick, right, audience, for those who don't know, um, the NBA has never had a black, what's the term, commissioner? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, It's been white dudes all the way down. They tend to hang around a while. Um, And while what I was reading this, I did not – know that i'm not actually surprised when i found out like you start reading this this chapter right talks about gordine and how like he kind of makes his way up through the ranks and all of that and you at least for me right it was like i i know where this is going but i hope that i am wrong yeah and look and give it a little bit more Context for Simon Dean. Simon Dean is an esteemed lawyer at this point. Started off in something different for sports, but the minute he got into it, he got hooked. And he basically became the commissioner before him. But I can't remember his first name, but I know his last name was Kennedy. So we'll just call him. I think it's Walter Kennedy. Walter Kennedy. Basically became his right hand man like had conversations with him about like hey man i think i'm i'm about i'm about out of here maybe i can get a key for him being like oh yeah for sure i've been thinking about that so he's basically getting groomed for the position and more or less gets stuffed at the end for someone who is much less much less a white dude with political connections we can we can be we can be straight up about this Oh, like yeah. the, part of part of part of the reason they chose the dudes that they did was in the hopes that they'd speed along the merger. Mm. It is well, his name was O'Brien. Might as well call him out. Who ended up getting the well, job? Let's, 
instead of I, I say the news just because, like, the thing is, the while Kennedy wanted Gordine. The uh, owners of the teams didn't, at, at no point, considered him a serious candidate. Not at all. And that goes into the aspect that I talked to you guys beforehand. Which is, so much of these things in sports is an accumulation of, like, a wider conversation. And the wider conversation yeah. that should be had, or not should, the wider conversation that I took away from this point was that racism cannot be combated by one person because it is a system and it is a numbers game, essentially. So Mm -hmm. one person who is anti-racist or not racist or not as racist cannot combat against nine people that are racist because- And pay his salary. Because when you, you know, democracy sounds all good until, like, there's racism involved. And then all of a sudden you understand that democracy can also be, like, unless actively countered against, a negative thing. Because it can, it continues to hold uh, 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 the less fortunate, um, the people with less majority, it, it's the continuation to hold, hold them down. Or it can be, at least. Um, and this is a perfect example of that. Um, and I was like, man... That's annoying because, you know, we talk about Gordine. It's hilarious because at one point he goes, uh, Gordine ultimately hoped that he could use his legal skills to reshape the NBA from within. And I just wrote next to that classic. Like, <laughs> we all know that person who's like, I'm going to join politics because I want to change this. I'm going to be a cop because I want to change the system from the inside out. And it's like, okay. But then you go into the system and the system either bogs you down or you reform to the system, right? Like that happens so many times. And Gordine tried that to reshape from the inside, but he was in a scenario at the time where the system said, uh, you thought, and uh, racism ensued and he was not able to rise to the levels of which he should have been able to go, uh, to been able to rise to. Um, yeah. Now, um, those are the biggest points that I personally took away from this chapter. Although, obviously, in terms of detail, there's so much detail and names that you would have not have known unless you read this chapter. Um, names that you know, when time goes by, that you know they kind of wither away to a degree, right? Um, but names of grave importance. Um, and Gordine and his impact should me should be more well known and i'm interested to ask the author why does she think it's not as well known as what it is because i might i have my own suspicions obviously but i'm curious about her thoughts look we've already we've already come across a few names that i felt like were needed to be scrubbed from the history books for like the nba's perception but should have at least popped up somewhere in the last 25 to 30 years as a need to like pay homage like anytime february come around something needs to be said about science because it's funny right because you have this whole fight racism you have the whole fight racism rhetoric um labeling whatever but i find it hilarious that if the NBA really wanted to fight racism and bring up these names, they would have to acknowledge how racist the NBA is and has been throughout its whole entire history. And that is a thing they won't do because it's bad for business. Is it, is it bad at this point that I feel like in the year 2023, you could say in 1967, we were kind of wilding and everybody is like, yeah. I feel like it's it's that easy. But, uh, it's really but, but, here, but here's, here's the issue with that. For you to say that, or for the NBA to say that, excuse me, they would have to fully incognizy, incognit, fully and be aware of the fact that they are not racist currently. The issue is they, they are. are. That, that is the biggest issue. Because you, 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 you can say that, but that's making a separation from the past to the present, 
when the separation hasn't been, when there has not been a severance yet. There is a clear lineage that goes, wow, Gordine was passed up at the time to be commissioner of the NBA and was like the protege essentially of like the commissioner at the time. And then that would have people thinking, wow, there still is no black commissioner. And then, you know, they want Adam Silver, Sterling passed. He's looked at by as he's looked at as like a bad guy for many people. Um, Sterling is or not Sterling, uh, Silver. He is not. Look, he's looking like at the good guy. This would help. This book showcases and helps it be known that it is not about the individual; it is the system. Individuals go away. But systems tend to last. In the NBA, for them to acknowledge that the past was an issue is them to acknowledge that the present is also an issue. And I don't, they just, they just don't want to do that because they're business and they're, once again, bad for business. I just think if this feels like one of those things that go back to lazy media. Like, if you go, if you go track mud in, at least try to help clean it up. Are you, but once again, we're talking about media, when you say bad and good media, ESPN, The initial story this, sped, spreads faster than the retraction. But this is also like privatized media. Like sports inherently is like private media, right? Like the main people that cover it that people listen to is like a private media, you know, they have revenue and stock and they're they're, they're fortune 500 whatever it is right they, they they're involved in all these different like ins and outs of like finance they control the narrative so like good media won't necessarily be shown to that highlight because that is the case mm. it's unfortunate but it's just a reality specifically when it comes to sports now we're talking about like world news things like that. That's completely different. Like there are certain outlets you can find that are like that way. But if you if you watch ESPN, like the majority of people do, if you just watch Fox Sports One, you're not going to get that because why would you get that and skip Bayless on the exact same uh, on the exact same channel? You got a point. You got a point. It's just sad. <laughs> but once again, sports is sad. Sports is political, but you know you take you know you take what you can out of it because it there are good there are good things, but to acknowledge the good things in their heights, you gotta acknowledge the bad things in their depths. So while I'm still thinking about it, because uh, I've already had this thought and forgot it, um, right? Something that is relatively frequently highlighted in the book um, is the tendency for the lead to do things. Um, to attempt to appeal to its white fans. Um, and, right, this extends to a lot of stuff in the book. The, the tough on crime stuff, right? Um, I would hear, wait, was that part two or was it part three? With Kermit Davis getting fined like 10 grand and uh, he was suspended for, right. hmm? Part I mean, not Ke- Davis, Washington. Um, That's part three, big dog. You giving away to part three. Dang it. Ah. Yeah. That's what you get for reading ahead. Look, part it's a good the- book. Fever. But, um, but, you know, a lot of that, a lot of the stuff that we're going to touch on here in a little bit, where, with the whole drug thing and whatever. Um, and like the hiring a bunch of former FBI people and stuff, um, stuff to kind of appease the white fans to give, and here in particular, right, the appeasing white fans means creating, if not creating either the reality or if nothing else, the illusion that they have their black players under control, um, because of course, right, black people are unruly and must be controlled, like. But, um, you know, something like the NBA is not unique in this. I have observed a tendency for a lot of organizations to play into the prejudices of their target audience, more or less. 
Right. Um, I mean, listen. You are 110% correct, Calvin. I mean, that's why it was so hard. And I don't know if it's still the case. But NASCAR, it, with the Confederate flag, like that whole entire scenario, like you cater to the fan base. Hockey allows fights because you have the glass up and it's a violent white sport, right? Like you're catering to the. Well, they even talked about it, and she even talked about it in the book. Like these things are, this is for everybody, right? And you, I mean, once again, that is. Good best once again, part of good business. Understanding who your fan base is and catering to them because you cater to the fan base, you will gain more money because they'll be more invested to the product. Something I thought I've that's been twirling around in my mind for quite a while though is like, is it not possible to cater to a fan base without indulging in its prejudices? Oh, hold on. That is the good one. That's a good one. Okay, hold on. I can repeat that real quick though. Love the person and love the culture at the same time. You, know, you kind of have to adopt it. Calvin, can you can you can you repeat your question real quick? Basically, can you like is it not possible to cater to a fan base without indulging in that fan base's prejudices? I think yes, but it depends on the origin of the thing, right? Like the origin of sports is. The origin of sports, generally speaking, is purely based off of class, right? Economics. Um, you can once again, you can go all the way back to Greek times, but you can also go all the way present to. There's a reason why Mexican, Black, and Italians were like the main boxers for forever. It's because they were below the poverty line, and there's a reason why traditional, just like generationally white individuals, played tennis, golf. And all these things because they're country club sports, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if sports in America, we talk about specifically, is is the its origins are catered to classism, then I don't think you can separate the two. I think you could, depending on the origins. But once again, with sports and its origins being that, I'm not sure if you can separate the two. Okay, but what I also wanted to point out is like. As we've been talking, thinking about how the NBA has handled various things and thinking about, uh, what's that term, virtue signaling, mm. right? Right. Um, basically, and maybe I'm misusing the term slightly, or maybe there's a better term for what I'm thinking of, but basically, right, doing certain things to signal a particular set of beliefs, an alignment with a certain set of beliefs. So, um, right, and like we often think about, like nowadays, right, we often think about the NBA as being pretty progressive, particularly as far as sports leagues go. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as I think about it, right, logically speaking, the NBA being as big as it is, Black folks aren't really the target audience still, uh -huh. right? Right. So um, a lot of like, – the argument could be made that a lot of the things they do in relation to – like when we start talking about like politics and supporting like Black Lives Matter or mm -hmm. getting rid of um, – what's his name? Donald something. Sterling? Thank you. Um, or um, even like the the more recent stuff in regards to like HBCUs and whatever um, isn't really like they don't. And this is going to be me be getting super super cynical. And we can get back to the book here in a second. But like they don't really care about like the nba doesn't care about black people they care what white people think they care that white people think that they care about black people <laughs> no, like i, I you were gonna go there and that is a thousand percent correct now i don't know you're gonna word it that way uh kanye uh but, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but like look old kanye was making sense 
I, I don't know who this new guy is. Yeah, <laughs> me either. Um, that no, that's that, that's real though, right? It is. It is catering. It is trying to find the comfortability because you don't actually want to do anything to ruffle feathers. To ruffle feathers, because if you did, it would be kind of productive to like the business at hand because at, at the end of the day commissioners whatever the owners own the nba the team owners own the nba now that sounds obvious but a lot of people for some reason don't think this now how many owners of the nba are black Jordan for now. Jordan, right? Outside of the charitable thing that Jordan has done in the last year and a half, two years, what has Jordan done to ruffle the feathers in a political sense that was counteractive to his capital gain at the end? Also, Jordan ain't pressed about black folks either. We, we don't need to pretend. Yes, Jordan... Jordan there was man, it's in my. It's, I have a book up here that talks about this whole thing, but Jordan actively, he actively did things through his career when he played that wouldn't ruffle feathers because he wanted to be apolitical, right? Uh, while other people in his generation weren't, he was like, I'm. He made a conscious decision to be apolitical, point blank, period. So with him being the only black american representative in this illustrious club of ownership in the nba you have no choice but to understand and to acknowledge what calvin just said the nba does not care about black people they care to catering people to think they care about black people no substance all surface uh there were several things in, oh, i'm sorry all gas with what you guys today i love it like, like the, there, there are several things in there but like we should probably get back to the book i mean but uh, but, but maybe and i'll and once again this is something i want to ask the author too the historian these types of books make you have these conversations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because, like, because I'd argue this is the book showcasing that these conversations, while there are certain scenarios that happen, specific scenarios that happen in the 60s, 50s, uh, 70s in the NBA, will continue to go forward. Those circumstances translate now. And if you can't connect those dots or you can't critically think about how those things intertwine, then you aren't taking the book at its value. Mm. Um, and because I'm, I'm curious, like, what does the author, what does she hope the audience gains from this book? Because obviously, and, what, and who is her target audience? Is her target audience people who care about this kind of stuff like us or is it just the common person? You know what I mean? You're your average person who's just whatever, right? Because um, all stuff is important. But once again, this book, if you're not having these conversations we're having right now, after you read this book, or while you're reading this book, then you're not reading the book. In, in fairness, there are some people who don't have the vocabulary or knowledge necessarily to have the quite, to quite have the kind of conversation that we're having. Should have went to HBCU. <laughs> 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 Hey, that's the perfect way to end this episode, man. <laughs> uh, Calvin, you got something else? Um, Wally yeah. Jones' story was in this section, right? I don't think so. Dang it. Okay, I gotta wait. Overachiever is what to you be continued. It's a good book. I read good books. That's how this works. It is. It is. This book is a bad go. Again, go get you your copy. You can't see mine because I got you. This darn Thank you, Cal. I guess I don't got you. Can't see Cal's either. Let me get it. I got you. 
Black ball. Go get black ball by Teresa Runstetter so you can join us on this journey of going through this book. It's a powerful read. I can't wait to sit down with Dr. Runstetter and run through uh, my questions because, oh, you got your hands full. <laughs> Come see us. <laughs> I appreciate you, appreciate you for sending us another copy. But again, thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the Travel Hoopers podcast with a special edition coming from this book right here, Black Ball. And guys, two people in front of me are my best friends in the world, and they're going to sign us out. As always, I'm Calvin McGowan. It's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been coming to you live from that desktop that your uh, kindergarten teacher had back in the day. Uh, if you know you are joining us on YouTube, like, share, subscribe, leave something in the comments, and uh, of course you can listen to us wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been fun. Yeah, my name's Philip Dixon, um, and just because you wear hoodies does not mean you can have an intellectual conversation at the same time. Uh, we appreciate you all joining us um, and thank you and I can't wait for you all to hear uh, the next rendition of the Traveling Cooper's Podcast. You made it sound so fancy. <laughs>